Israel. Luke chapter 2, verse number 39. I preached on this passage of Scripture before. I want to kind of give you a little bit of a different angle. Luke chapter 2, verse number 39, if you will. The Bible says this, And when they had performed all things according to the law of the Lord, they returned into Galilee to their own city, Nazareth. And the child grew and waxed strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. Of course, this is speaking of Mary and Joseph and, and uh, doing some various things and uh, gone and visit uh, uh, Anna, Anna and a few other things here. And then in verse 41, it says, Now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. And when he, that is Jesus, was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem after the custom of the feast. And when they had fulfilled the days as they returned, the child Jesus tarried behind in Jerusalem, and Joseph and his mother knew not of it. But they, supposing him to have been in the country, went a day's journey, and they sought him among their kinsfolk and acquaintance. And when they found him not, they turned back again to Jerusalem, seeking him. And it came to pass that after three days, they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the doctors, both hearing them and asking them questions. And all that heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. And when they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said unto him, Son, why hast thou thus dealt with us? Behold, thy father and I have sought thee sorrowing. And he said unto them, How is it that you sought me? Wist ye not, or don't you know, that I must be about my father's business? And they understood not the saying which he spake unto them. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was subject unto them. But his mother kept all these sayings in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. This morning, I just want to give you a few quick thoughts on the subject and how relevant this subject has become in the last 30 years of keeping Christ in Christmas. In our text, uh, we see several things that we ought to strive to do what is right, but oftentimes we tend to leave behind He who makes things right. And this morning, our objective is this. How do you and I keep Christ in Christmas? Father in heaven, we thank you for the opportunity to look at your word today. We thank you, Father, for these folks who have come out. And Lord, we pray that you would help us, Lord, to see something from your word this morning that would be a help to us. And Lord, as we approach Christmas Day and Christmas Eve, Lord, as many of us will be gathered with family and friends, Lord, there's no doubt that not everybody is going to agree on everything. And Father, I pray that, Lord, you would help us to know what we believe and why we believe it. And Father, make special sure that we keep Christ in the center of Christmas. And Father, we pray this morning that you would lead, guide, and direct as only you can. Father, if there be somebody here this morning that doesn't know you as Lord and Savior, that has not made you the king of their life, then, Lord, I pray that you would burden their hearts this morning, for it's in your name we ask it. And all of God's children said, Amen. There is no doubt that over the last several years, and really the last 30 years, there has been a concerted effort every time we come around the Thanksgiving time to question and put in doubt the notion of whether Jesus Christ was a historical figure or not. And there's no doubt there's always some Newsweek article or a Time Magazine article or some Life article that'll come out and some guy will come out with some sort of credentials and say, well, we're not too sure about this and we're not even sure if he was born here or there. We're not sure about the star. We're not sure about Jerusalem. We're not sure about this whole notion of being born of a virgin. Let's put all that stuff aside for just a second and just let's just make this very clear point. Jesus Christ was a historical figure. That's a fact. Now, let's, 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 let's stay away from the fact that He claimed to be God in the flesh. We understand that all scripturally. Let's stay away from the fact uh, that, uh, you know, the, the, the Jews hailed Him as the King and so on and so forth. But let's just leave all that aside for just a second. Let's just understand that He is a historical figure. 
Uh, there's one book that I suggest you to read if, in fact, you have not read it before. Uh, but if you need some evidence for that, if you need really some hardcore evidence, now don't just listen to everybody. Now I want you to listen to me, but I don't want you to just listen to everybody. Because there are a lot of people on both sides of this argument, and what you need to do is get a full, rounded argument. Amen? And one of the books that I think will be very helpful is called The Case for Christ. It's written by Lee Strobel. Now, I don't agree with every interviewee in there, and I don't necessarily agree with Lee Strobel on everything, but I think the book in general gives a pretty balanced view that every scholar that is at least interviewed in this book uh, would come to the consensus that, yes, Jesus Christ was a historical figure. Again, not dealing with the, the deity aspect, not dealing uh, with the whole virgin birth aspect, just simply saying, hey, listen, he is a historical figure. We can start there. Once we establish that he's historical, then we can move on to the scriptural notations. Amen? So it, it's very easy to do that. But, but I want you to understand that you have to start with that correct premise, that he is indeed a historical figure. And then from that point, we move to talking about the virgin birth and talking about the deity of our Lord Jesus Christ. And, and yes, we have to interject that one word that most scientists would run away from, even though all of their theories are based on the same thing, and that one word is miracle. It is funny that uh, uh, they so demand that we have the minutia of evidence to support the notion of Christ, which, by the way, there's much of it out there. But yet we are supposed to blindly believe that evolution is true, though there is a missing link. The problem with their link is it's still missing. And so we're supposed to blindly believe that there's no transitional life form because it's, quote, a missing link. But yet they can't believe the plethora of historical evidence that is out there to substantiate that Jesus Christ is a historical figure. There's no missing link about it, folks. There's no Archaeopteryx. There's no uh, Neanderthal man. There's no Lucy. There's none of that. There's this guy that walked for 33 years named Jesus Christ, and it is a fact, not just, by the way, uh, by Christians, but a lot of secular scientists and historians have also concluded that. But one of the things that we need to do, especially around this time, is heighten our evangelism and heighten our knowledge of who Christ is because it's around the holiday periods of Thanksgiving to about New Year where people kind of get sensitive to this notion and, and kind of bring it up in a more relaxed environment than they would between January to October. And it's an opportunity for you and I to evangelize with questions and, yes, evangelize with answers. And there needs to be good reasons why we believe what we believe. Amen? We have to understand that one of the things that I have always disliked are the Polly Wanna Cracker Christians. That is, everything the pastor says, you just eat the cracker he's given you. Amen? I, I need you to not just believe what I say. I need you to verify it on your own. You know, the Bible says, study to show yourselves approved yourself, and then unto God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Listen, it is your job and my job to study out God's word. And by the way, we not only study out God's word, but then we use secular sources that more than abundantly substantiate the scriptural record. So it's very, very clear that this is the case. And by the way, if he wasn't historical, and if Christ wasn't born, and if Christmas doesn't celebrate something that's centered around Christ, then why the whole hullabaloo of trying to get rid of it? I've often found it odd that people are scared of something that they believe doesn't exist. If it doesn't exist, shut up. You know, just keep your mouth shut. Just let all these dumb people believe in something invisible. I mean, you believe in a theory that's invisible. You guys assume that there's a missing link. You guys assume that billions of years ago that it rained on rocks and then the rocks did this and then some microbial embryonic thing stepped out of it, you know, and then it had to meet up with another thing that was like that and then millions of years later popped up. Here we are! We all got PhDs. Listen, folks. Fairy tales are believed not only by children but by adults. 
and we've got to be very careful. But what we want to do is make sure we separate fact from fiction. And what we need to do during this holiday season is to heighten our evangelism and heighten our knowledge of who Christ is. The first thing I want to say, and from our text of Scripture that we just read, in order to keep Christ in Christmas, we must make sure that Christmas does not become a custom. Now, I want you to look at verses 41 through 42. Now, his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover, and when he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem after the what? Custom of the feast. Now, let me just say that, biblically speaking, this was a custom that the Jews were almost required to adhere to. I understand that. But we must understand that in order to keep Christ central, we must make sure that Christmas, as we understand it biblically, does not become just another custom that we just kind of punch a time clock for. Let's be careful in treating, let's be careful in treating Christmas as just a time for gifts, Christmas trees, candy canes, and the like. Now listen, I got nothing wrong with gifts. I want them. Please, church, buy me something. Uh, Christmas trees, we talked about it this morning in Sunday school. Candy canes, love them. Especially if you got bad breath, eat them, please. I I like all the things associated with Christmas. I love the the ham and I love the turkey. I love all the the things that are associated with the food. But more importantly, I I love the Savior who we're supposed to be revering at this time. Uh, Christmas should not be customary, but rather Christmas should be Christ-centered. The problem is, Christmas has become custom-centered, but it should be Christ-centered. Christmas trees are natural. Candy canes, they're natural. Uh, Christmas gifts, natural. Jesus Christ, on the other hand, supernatural. Different ballgame. We're we're heightening it up. He's beyond a tree. He's beyond a candy cane. He's beyond just Christmas gifts. He's the ultimate gift. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth on Him should not perish but have everlasting life. And as I said in Sunday school, no matter if you're naughty and nice, that gift has been presented to you. He transcends custom and should be, I know how trite this phrase might be, the reason we celebrate the season. In order to keep Christ in Christmas, we must make sure that Christmas does not become just ordinary and plain and custom. Folks, this should be an opportunity for us to heighten our knowledge, to to, to hone our skill, to evangelize, to make sure that we know why what we, excuse me, that we know why what we believe and so on and so forth. We need to make sure we can communicate to people effectively. This is why we believe Christmas should be Christ-centered. And I've got no problem in my personal opinion. If you want to Uh, do all your other little traditions in Christmas. Listen, we've got some odd traditions in my family. Uh, My my wife's side of the family, my mother-in-law is is German. And they've got this weird thing where, you know, all the kids go into one room with at least one or two adults. And while while they're in the rooms, uh, we need to listen for a bell that rings because at that point, all the presents will be then, you know, displayed prominently on the ground and they're all sectioned off for whoever gets what. I usually always get one package and the other guys get like 50 over here. But you know, I got you know one package here for this guy, one package here for this guy, and three packages there for that person. And that's just something ever since I got married, that's just what we do. Now is that Christ-centered? No. That's gift-centered, which I kind of like too. But I, I'm not poo-pooing that. I'm just simply saying, understand that that's just your family tradition. That's not a Christ tradition. And, and, and you, it, it's always important to do this too. Santa should not be prominent. It should be Jesus Christ. Now listen, I don't, I don't mind if you got a Santa Claus. I'm just saying, can you put a nativity scene up, please? I mean, at least make some recognition. Hey, this is the reason why we celebrate here. I, I, I don't get offended walking through the town center and seeing Santa at, by the Macy's. I got no problem with that. Fine. The problem is he's over in Sherman Oaks too. He's over in Calabasas. He's in Glendale Galleria. <laughs> he's everywhere. He's omnipresent. I mean, he's everywhere. <laughs> but I got no problem with that. But just understand, that's not the reason. That's not the reason. In order to keep Christ in Christmas, we must make sure that Christmas does not become a custom. Secondly, in order to keep Christ in Christmas, don't assume that Christ is part of the season. You say, what do you mean by that? 
Well, we live in a time in history where Christianity and Jesus Christ are seen as more of a nuisance than a necessity. And I want you to notice in verse number 43 and following. And when they had fulfilled the days, that is after the custom of the feast in verse 42, uh, 42, as they returned, the child Jesus tarried behind in Jerusalem, and Joseph and his mother knew not of it. But they, supposing him to have been in the company, went a day's journey, and they sought him among their kinsfolk and acquaintance. And they found him not. They turned back again to Jerusalem seeking him. And as I said, folks, we live in a time in history where Christianity and Jesus Christ are seen as nothing more as a nuisance as opposed to a necessity. Therefore, the world has been, is, and will continue to be a place where they make sure that Christ is not a part of the season. And it is up to you as God's child to interject and make sure that Jesus Christ is the central focus of Christmas. Do not assume that everybody believes exactly what you believe on this subject. It's like Mary and Joseph. They just assumed, they just supposed that he was part of the company. Verse 44. And they went a whole day's journey and they sought among their kinsfolk and their acquaintance thinking, well, they, he's bound to be amongst our family members. That isn't always the case either. Don't assume that everyone believes exactly like you believe. I remember 15, 20 years ago, there was this big push for Kwanzaa. If you like Kwanzaa, great. But listen, that's not the reason for the season. Uh, there was a big push for, you know, whatever secular, the winter solstice or whatever. That's not the reason for the season. I don't care that they celebrate that. I don't mind. It's diverse nation. Amen. Wonderful. Liberty. You know, United States of America. Praise the Lord. But understand that this is the reason. But we just assume that, especially around the holiday seasons, because everyone wants to talk about the Lord and everyone wants to, you know, at least have some sort of discussion about the attempt of going to church services on Christmas, that we just assume everyone's on board. They're not. Everyone's not on board. They got no problem believing the little babe wrapped in swaddling clothes in that manger. They got a real problem when they hear the preacher talking about the lion of the tribe of Judah. They got no problem talking about the lowly lamb. They got a real problem talking about a roaring lion coming back seeking whom he may devour, using, by the way, the devil's antidote there. They got a real problem with that. But listen, in order for us to be fair, we must present the lowly lamb. But we also must be fair and say, but he's coming back like a lion. I like that little bumper sticker. You've heard me say it before, and you've probably read it yourself. Jesus Christ is coming back, and boy, is he mad. Well, I hope he's not mad at me. <laughs> and I hope he ain't mad at you, but, but I know that he's upset. But listen, not even among your own kinsfolk and acquaintances can you just assume that they just believe like you do on this. You know, it's amazing. I remember having this big discussion. Uh, I've got some, you know, some Roman Catholics in my family and uh, on, my, on my dad's side. And you just assume that they're, and, and it's unfortunate my, on my part, but I assumed, you know, they're, they're going to believe exactly kind of like what we believe on this subject. And, and, and we got into this debate, this is several years ago, and, and she's a relatively faithful Catholic, and it was very confusing f- for me to hear her say this. She says, yeah, I just don't really know about this whole virgin birth thing. Oh, okay, okay. Well, I says, you've got other issues to deal with, but let's deal with this virgin birth thing here real quick here. I says, what's wrong with that? He says, well, that's impossible. I says, yeah. It's kind of the point, isn't it? I mean, it's, it's impossible that he would be, yes, it's impossible. Well, you know, I just, you know, we, we live in a very, you know, scientifically endued society, you know, and, you know, the knowledge and all that. There's other ways, natural ways to explain that. Really explain that to me. Explain to me how a virgin can have a child in her womb, but then after she has the baby, she still is a virgin for at least a little bit. Explain that to me. Well, I mean, if you go with a biblical account, I says, well, what other account you want to go with? I says, to be frank, I says, and I don't want to use Catholic tradition here, I says, you're kind of stepping against your own tradition. I says, and I ain't a Catholic. I says, uh, if I'm not mistaken, your archbishops and your pope, at that time was Pope John Paul II, I says, if I'm not mistaken, those guys believe in the virgin birth. Uh, 
your problem is not just with me and with God. Your problem is with your Pope boys. <laughs> and I says, you're going to have to take care of this thing on yourself. I said, what about that catechism? Didn't you, guys, didn't you guys quote a catechism and at least go through it when you guys became a Catholic? Yeah. I says, what are one of the things you said in that catechism that we believe that he was? Oh, really? I said, did you lie? Well, I, don't, I, I believe I just basically said what they wanted me to say. Oh, so then you did lie. And then the argument just, let me just say this, just went downhill quickly. Okay. <laughs> you, you, let me just say this. You don't want to use my methods for arguments with your own arguments, okay? You, you probably got better ways of doing it. Me, it always ends confrontational. I don't want it to, but it just always does because I'm just better in a shouting match. But listen, in order to keep Christ in Christmas, don't assume that Christ is part of the season that everyone's on board with you. You've got to be able to know who Christ is, why the season is, why the season is. He was born of a virgin, that he, was, uh, that he died on a cross, and you've got to be able to lay that out. Don't assume everybody believes that. Everyone's real comfortable with the baby Jesus. They're not comfortable with the lion of the tribe of Judah. Thirdly, in order to keep Christ in Christmas, be ready to ask and answer questions that make much of Christ. Look at verses 45 and following. And when they found him not, they turned back again to Jerusalem, seeking him. And it came to pass that after three days... Now, can you imagine, Mom, Dad? Three days. I, I, yeah, yeah. Eloy's saying that's a vacation for us. But anyway, <laughs> but I, I remember being, you know, two aisles over in a store yelling to, at the top of my lungs for my mother uh, when I was much younger, obviously, not uh, recently, but, you know, much younger. And, and, and I thought, oh, my goodness, she'll never find me. And, you know, little did I know she was a couple of aisles over saying, shut up! You know, and so <laughs> here she finds me, you know, and I'm thinking, three days? And you haven't found your kid? Yeah, you're talking about some lousy parents. But anyway, verse 46, and it came to pass that after three days they found him at the temple, sitting in the midst of the doctors, both hearing them and asking them questions. Now, I want you to notice that last phrase, both hearing them. Stop. Christian, you ought to hear some people first. Let me tell you what we're good at running roughshod over them with statements. What we ought to do first, and I think we should take a page from Christ, is we need to hear people out first. Amen. Why do you believe that? And then hear them out. And then ask them questions about what they just asked you. I don't know if you uh, remember watching Columbo. You know, you know, he always looks disheveled, you know, hair just all muffed up, and you never could take this guy seriously. And it just seemed like at the end of the show, you know, oh, man, he's going to lose it. And they, I got just one more question. You know, just, 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 ah, something's been bugging me, you know. And he asked the question, and then that did it. Man, that question always nailed it. Listen, statements confuse, questions convict. You ask questions of people, and in a roundabout way, it's challenging their notion. Because that's what a question is meant to do. It's meant to stimulate the other person's mind into thinking, well, why do I think that? Well, maybe you ought to think about that a little bit. Jesus Christ and the apostles were not afraid of questions. There's nothing wrong with them. In fact, Jesus Christ and His apostles answered many of the questions that were posed to them. In many ways, Jesus Christ would then give them a, a parable of some sort. And when somebody asks you why you do what you do the way you do it, you, you should be ready to give an answer that points them to the reason for the season, Jesus Christ. Amen. In other words, evangelize with your questions, and yes, evangelize with your answers. In every aspect, make much of the person of Christ. The best way that you and I can keep Christ in the central aspect of Christmas is to expand the base of Christianity. Amen. Man, get, every, get other people in on this. Listen, God's family is ever expanding. I'm glad that God is interested in multiplication and not subtraction. I'm, God, I'm glad that God wants to be a part, wants everyone to be a part of his family. I, it breaks my heart to know that not everybody wants to be a part of that family. But I, I'm so glad that he's into multiplication. Man, he wants to expand the base of his family. And you know what? What a great opportunity for us. Evangelism is going to come to our houses. 
You are going to be going to their houses. What an opportunity to just make much of the Savior. Amen. To make much of Christ. Listen, we started off with the hymn this morning, I love to tell the story. Let me ask you, do you love it? Do you love to tell it? Of unseen things above? Of Jesus and His glory? Of Jesus and His love? Listen, I've told it so many times, you'd think rationally it'd get old. There's some things that I've said from this pulpit, statements, jokes, whatever, you're like, I don't know, I've heard that one a zillion times. <laughs> Come on, man, we're going to have to put a new guy up here for new jokes. Listen, just give me better material. You know, just give me better material. Listen, the more new people we have, then I can just kind of, we can dovetail off those guys. But no matter how bored you might get with a, a particular anecdote I might give out or, or a particular joke or, you know, a, a, an expression I might use, Nothing gets old about Jesus. Amen. Just nothing gets old about it. I love to tell the story. It's been as sweet to me today as the day I found Him. As far as I'm concerned, the story will never get old. Amen. I love to tell how I met Him. I I love to introduce him to people that are willing to listen. And folks, don't ever get tired of telling it. It's the most precious news you have ever heard. 